hear about that next week. This week, we're going to talk, we're starting our, we're really starting our series into Matthew, okay? We've already really been kind of flirting around with that, but we're going to start in Matthew 3 because we did 1 and 2 at Christmas. You can find those on our website, uh, those messages for chapters 1 and 2. But today, we're going to start in chapter 3, and the word of the day, right, Sesame Street here, okay? What's the word of the day? You will never hear this word on Sesame Street, though. The word of the day is repentance. Yeah, right. No, I'd rather it be truck or food or, you know, anything else. We don't hear that word a lot in our culture, but we hear it a lot in church, and we throw it around like we know what it means and like everybody knows what it means, but the reality is we probably kind of know what it means, but we don't necessarily have a good grip on it. Now, the reason we're focusing on that word is because chapter 3 focuses on that word, okay? And the, um, the context in which that's happening is is the baptism of Jews and the baptism of Jesus. Okay, so we're going to look at that through the eyes of the Jews that were there, the religious leaders that were there. Jesus, of course, is there. And um, John the baptizer. We'll find out about him, too. Before we do that, I'd like to pray. Lord God, I thank you for the privilege of speaking today. I pray that as we open your word and we look at it that you would help us to have eyes to see and ears to hear what it is you want us to see and hear and that you would give us the faith and the humility and the courage to respond as you lead us to Lord I pray that you'll forgive me for my sins that you'll cleanse me by your spirit because of the blood of Christ and that you'll fill me up so that I may overflow with living water that is transformative, not just for me, but for those that you choose to bless through the efforts that are made here today. I'm not worthy of this. I'm not deserving of this. I'm not any more special than anyone else. I'm just using the gifts you handed me to the best of my ability. And I pray that you'll take my meager offering and multiply it into something transformative for our individuals in this room, for individuals watching online, for us collectively as a church, for our good and your glory. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. So um, whenever, if you ever get a chance to preach and someone asks you to preach, you should do it, okay? And yes, the first time is terrifying. And it's not the only time it's terrifying, but it gets easier over time. But I would encourage you to do it. And here's one of the things you'll notice whenever you're, you're preparing your message, unless you're preparing it Saturday night, which I don't recommend. They call those, they call those Saturday night specials. Did you know that? It's church lingo, preacher lingo. If you've got a Saturday night special, it means you started Saturday night. Some people work on it all night. Most preachers don't do that. Most preachers work on it from Saturday night and go to bed. Um, Fortunately, God it gives me a little more discipline enough so that doesn't happen. But so when you're working on it through the week, as you're reading and you're thinking, you're processing, of course, God also adds all kinds of object lessons and illustrations for you personally to learn the message yourself. So I've been practicing all week repenting. <laughs> it is not what I wanted to be doing, I promise you. <laughs> I'm going to give you one story to exemplify this. So... Um, Early in the year, I took the CWP class, the Concealed Weapons Permit, to try to get, my, to get the permit so that I could carry. And uh, done, I did the class. Brian Smith and I went through the class together, and we passed the test, and we sent off all our paperwork, and then it's, you know, sent off our money, and then we wait. And I didn't, we didn't hear, and I haven't heard and heard and heard until this past week. On Thursday, I got a letter from, an you know, official letter, and, and I'm, it said... Um, we haven't gotten that information we asked for from you, and so you have really, you know, you need to get on this or this is going to expire. And I'm like, oh, no, I haven't gotten any letters from them. So I call them up on Friday, and I say, um, what do you need? And they said, well, the fingerprint cards you sent in are smudged. They're not usable. We need you to do that again. I'm like, well, when's the deadline? And they're like, well, there's no deadline. You just need to hurry up and do it. I'm like, oh, great. That's real helpful. It's Friday afternoon, about a little after 3, and I'm looking at my watch. I'm going, City of Goose Creek, that's where I got my fingerprints done. They'll do them for you for a small fee. Um, they close at 4. I called to make sure. Yep, we're open till 4. So I said, so I jump in the car and I head over. 
you know how you do the GPS, make sure you get to take the quickest route because traffic changes things. And the time, you know, it tells you the arrival time. The t arrival time is 3.53. <laughs> uh, and I didn't really look at it for a while. I'm driving along and I look and I'm like, whoa, that's, that's cutting it close. I'm starting to sweat it a little bit. Well, you know how Friday afternoons are in Somerville. Traffic doesn't get better as the day goes on. It gets worse. And so I'm watching the time go 3.53, 3.54. 3.55, I get to a light on old Ladson, uh, Lincolnville Road to Ladson Road. You know that left turn? 3.56, 3.57, I'm like, oh, this is not good. Finally, I get through the light, and it stabilizes. And so I've still got half the trip to go. And this is a 40-minute drive, it turns out. So I'm having all kinds of conversations with myself, not so much with God, and I'm not happy about how I'm here. I'm not happy with uh, the guy who did the fingerprints. I'm not happy with... Uh, CWP people, uh, sled group in, in Columbia. I'm not happy with anybody. Traffic, lights, it doesn't matter. Um, and so I'm having these conversations. So, and the time is it's holding at 3.57. I'm getting closer. I'm almost there. It's 3.58 when I pull into the parking spot. I know where to go because I've done this before. So I run to the police department. I go to the window. She's still there. And I said, I'm the one who called. I'm here to, do, uh, to get my fingerprints. And she picks up the phone to call the person in the back who does the fingerprints. She says something, she hangs up, and she says, I'm sorry, they just left. I am so happy at that moment. <laughs> so I don't chew her out, I don't fuss at her, it's not her fault, and fortunately I kept it together long enough to get outside and get in the car, and I just sat in the car. I just, not in a good place. And... I'm like, Lord, why did you just let me waste 40 minutes? It's going to be another 40 minutes back. No, it'll be longer because the traffic's worse going home. And already, he's, I'm already answering the question, right? Because I get these questions, and I know the answers, right? And, of course, the one that I, this is the bomb you drop whenever you want to um, Jesus juke somebody. You just say, Romans 8.28. In all things, God works for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Do you believe that? <coughs> yep. And so the drive home, I was still talking to myself and doing lots of muttering, but there were some prayers mixed in that included repentance. As God worked in my heart and tried to get me to a place where I wasn't just sorry that I had to drive the 40 minutes around both ways, each way, but I got to the place where I was like, when I behave that way, when I carry that attitude, and anything else that comes out as a result of that mindset, that I've sinned against my good God. And the Bible says that when I sin, I quench the Holy Spirit, which is like throwing water on a campfire, and I grieve the Holy Spirit, which is like going to a funeral. And I did those things because of the way I acted and thought and behaved. In the car where nobody was looking and nobody had to know. See, just be careful when they ask you to preach. But I think it's important for you to hear that. Because the definition of repentance is not just say I repent and move on. It's not just to say to God I'm sorry. Even if you are. It's more than that. Repentance is a changing in the way that you're thinking about what you've just done or said or thought in such a way that leads to a better outcome. It's changing your thinking that changes your living. Thinking affects your beliefs. So you could say it's reorienting my beliefs on the truth so that my behaviors reflect what I really, really believe. Actually, your behaviors always reflect what you really believe. And that's convicting, right? Because sometimes our behaviors don't look like what we say we believe. And that's called hypocrisy. And that's why I can say I'm with you. I'm, I'm, a, I can, I'm a hypocrite. So if someone ever says to you, I don't go to church because all those hypocrites are there. I'm like, well, the preacher said he's one too. So at least you'll blend in. <laughs> Careful who you say that to. I'm not sure that'll... So today's message is entitled, What is Repentance? The bottom line is that repentance is the changing of your thinking in such a way that it changes in your living. Okay? And that's really what we're about. So I've been practicing. I'm still not really great at this. Okay? I'm still practicing. I've been doing it all morning. Just know that um, it's okay to try. And, and, and repentance isn't something you do once. And then you say, oh, I'm saved. I don't need to do that anymore. 
there's repentance that leads to salvation. Salvation comes in three stages, according to the Bible. Salvation comes at the very beginning. There's an instantaneous moment when you move from enemy of God to child of God, and it's called justification. Moment it happens, and that's all based on God. Justification. That's the beginning of salvation. And that's why I can say to you, I've been saved because I've been justified by the blood of Jesus, which means declared right by God. But salvation is more than just justification. Salvation is also sanctification, which is the journey that you and I are on, if you're with me, and that we are becoming more and more like Jesus. And that's a cycle that we live through where we sin, forget who God is, are tempted, sin, like giving into that temptation, and then we cry out to God when we feel the consequences of those actions, and we turn to him, and we pray for mercy, and God brings forgiveness when we repent. And we get back to a good place. And then we forget God again and we, we, we give in to the temptation and we sin and we cry out to God. It's the book of Judges in a nutshell, right? Over and over, cycles and cycles and cycles. And, and sanctification is the process of going through those cycles in such a way that you're, making, you're, you're, you're moving towards God. In other words, it's not a matter of how close I am to God. It's a matter of am I facing and heading in that direction. Repentance isn't where you are as far as far or close to God. Repentance is which way are you headed. You could be here very close to God and heading away from God. Or you could be very far away from God but heading towards him. That's the better place. Repentance gets us heading in the right direction. Okay, the word literally, if it's a, as a military term, repent means to do an about face. To do a 180 spiritually. Okay? It's okay, it's mine. <laughs> All right, so let's jump into the text. Um, I'm just going to warn you, I'm going over today. I'm sorry. If you have kids, we're going to get over there to the children's really quickly. Um, but I, I want to do, this whole chapter goes together, and I want to I finish it together. So if you'll bear with me, let's read through it and work through it together. And then we'll celebrate the Lord's Supper, sing, repent, and leave. <laughs> hey, hey, hey. In those days, John the Baptist, some translations call him John the Baptizer. Why? Because he baptized people, okay? The baptism was a little different, not just in where they did it. Here they're doing it in the River Jordan, but what it meant, we're not going to focus on that, but I will explain. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, that's near Jerusalem, and saying, here's his message, repent, the kingdom of heaven has come near and then, he, and then he says, this, Matthew writes, This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah lived 700 years earlier. Matthew's quoting this Jewish prophet, and this is what the prophet Isaiah said about John the Baptist. He didn't call him that, but this is the one he was describing. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, he's in the wilderness preaching, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. In other words, move the obstacles, the king is coming. Let's clear the roads. It's almost like they're saying, hey, the king is coming to town. Mow your yard, okay? <laughs> you know, clean the windows. Um, put the couch in the back and get it off the front porch. Clean up, kind of prepare the way. The king is coming. And this is something that would happen in history. All kinds of cultures. When a king would come to a, a village or town and he's traveling through with his entourage, he would send heralds ahead to say, good news, the king is coming. Now, that's not always good news. But if it's a good king, it can be. And so, John the Baptist has one job. Prepare, for the, prepare God's people for the arrival of their king. Now, who is God's people? The Jews, okay? So we're in Israel, we're talking about the Hebrews, and they um, have not heard a word from a prophet of God in 400 years. The last prophet they heard was that good old Italian prophet Malachi, that some people call Malachi, and he... He said, there's someone coming. I had no idea that would be. Um, he said, someone is coming that uh, was going to turn the hearts of the dads towards their kids. Now, I love that. Maybe that's Father's Day. I don't know. Maybe turn the hearts of the fathers back towards their kids. That implies they're not always there. Okay? So... So, who, so this John the Baptist, who is John the Baptist? Where does he come from? He's not the John that wrote any of the scriptures in the Bible. He's Jesus' cousin. He's six months older. If you remember the Christmas story, you might remember Zachariah and Elizabeth. Zachariah was a priest, and he took his turn in the temple, and that angel shows up, and the angel says, you're going to have a boy, even though you guys are ancient. You're going to have a boy. 
And he's like, I don't believe you. And so he's mute for nine months during the pregnancy because the angel's like, you will not speak until I prove to you that you're wrong. And John the Baptist, John the Baptist is the result. And so he's in his early 30s, and he has done nothing but all his life but prepare to do what he's doing right now. What is he doing? He is preaching a very simple sermon. This is a sermon. I don't know if y'all would like me preaching this sermon all the time or not because it's, it would be very repetitive. It would be very short. And we'd get to lunch earlier. But it starts off repent. Okay? And unless you're walking with the Lord consistently, um, that's not a comfortable message. It's a good message. And it's meant to prepare for what? The one who will come in grace with grace and truth. The one who will come sovereignly in charge and yet lovingly willing to let you walk away. Okay? That's Jesus. Okay? So John already knows who Jesus is. They know each other. They've probably played games together as kids, although John was probably always like, let's go play in the desert. Come on. And Jesus is like, what? Ah, no. Let's stay near home. Um, and, you know, so I don't know how they got along. We don't get any of those stories, at least not in the Bible. But here we are, and, and it says that John was just very, he was very focused. Because even in his mind, I have one job, prepare these people. And so to do that, you know, he doesn't have a Bible. He can just go and, well, let me study the scripture. He doesn't have that. He's got, um, you know, he just goes out into the wilderness with his Eno, and he says, I'm just going to hang out here with God for years. I'm going to eat really weird stuff. And I'm going to wear really goofy looking things and uncomfortable. And I'm going to live very simply so that I have no distractions. Boy, there's a sermon here for Americans, isn't there? So I have no distractions and I can hear the voice of God. And I don't have all this other noise going on. John's clothes were made of camel's hair. And he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. Okay. I don't know if that's locust the flower. I don't know if that's locust the bug. I don't really think it matters. Neither one sounds good to me. Wild honey, though. But that means he's sticking his hand in and getting stung so he can, I mean, this isn't go buy a jar of honey, right? So this is John. He's, he's a wild man. His beard is probably unkempt. His hair is probably long and unkempt, and he, but he's preaching. Repent. For the kingdom of God has come near. Now, Jesus will preach the same message, and we'll see it in chapter 4 in a couple of weeks, but he's, uh, he also says it in Mark 1.15. He says this. This is what Jesus writes. He says, the time has come. Some of you have heard me talk about the Kairos moment. It's, that, it's not just another moment. In it's a special moment. The time has come, Kairos. He said, the kingdom of God has come near. And then he says this, repent and believe the good news. So John and Jesus give you the reason to repent. The reason to repent and believe the good news is because it is good news. And you and I are believing bad news or not even knowing about the bad news. And so he's, he, John says, here's the reason. The reason you repent is because the kingdom of God is near. Now, if you're like most people, that totally doesn't move you at all. Okay, kingdom of God is here. So what? Well, that implies that the king is here. That might raise your pulse a little bit more if you're not really thinking this through. Jesus is the king. He is the creator. He is the sustainer. He is our redeemer. He is the reason we have any hope for a future beyond this life that's good. But he's also the hope we have to make something that makes sense out of this life that's not always good. And while I can't dive deep on this, you have to get to the point whether or not you believe the Bible when the Bible says that God wants to bless you and the way he wants to bless you is through the king and his kingdom. And the king is Jesus. And until you believe that, it's not going to feel like good news. Okay? But here's the thing. Every single person born on planet Earth, except for Jesus, was born with a terminal disease, a spiritual disease and when we were born with that disease, at least before we get to the New Testament, there was no cure. There was talk of a cure, and you could believe in this cure that was coming, but there was no cure. 
There were religious ceremonies that were built around this future cure that was going to happen, and so they would sacrifice animals saying, this is the one that's going to come, and this, you know, just kind of imagery and confusion and lots of blood, and, oh, I don't understand. But it's all pointing to, yeah, there's going to be a cure for this terminal disease. Just trust. And then Jesus shows up, and we begin to hear the good news. There's a cure for this terminal disease called sin. Okay? And the bottle of, if you will, of the cure is available, but not automatic. It's not like, you know, just, you just show up and they, they give you, you know, intravenously the cure. You have to do something. Not to earn it, but you have to just basically say, I believe that this cure works. And that's what faith in Jesus Christ is about. It's believing that it really is good news that the king and the kingdom are coming. Now, when John presents this message, it's kind of a take it or leave it. He's not trying to impress. He's not giving a bunch of illustrations. He's not telling you stories. He's kind of like, I don't care what these people do. I'm just saying what God told me to say because he told me to say it. I don't even know if he's smiling. Now, he is in the water, and he might be splashing around. I don't know. But when, you're, when you preach, repent, the kingdom of God is near, you're probably not going to play with rubber duckies in the Jordan River. You're, you're serious about what you're doing. And, and, so, and what's happening is all these people start coming. Now, I don't know about you, but if I had been in that day, I think I would have gone where there were people to preach. I mean, I'd probably go to a city. Jerusalem would probably be a good start. Maybe I would just outside the temple so I don't get in too much trouble and start preaching because there's lots of people there, thousands, tens of thousands. And he goes out into the middle of nowhere next to a river, and he starts preaching. And I guess his disciples there, he had disciples too, and so he's preaching to them. And it's kind of like preaching to the choir, right? Like they already repented and believed, so I'm going to preach to them. And like, so, but the word spread. The word spread all over the region, and people started coming from even outside of Israel, from the Decapolis, from Syria, from Tyre and Sidon, not to mention all within. And so this is what's happening. And there come people, verse 5, people went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan. So the Jordan is short for Jordan River. This is what they were doing. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. Now, confession is not the same as repentance exactly. They're two different words. Some people say there's no such thing as synonyms, right? They're not, if they're the same, then why are they different words? Anyway, um, so confession, though, is within repentance. So to, con to confess is to begin to repent. To confess is to agree with God that that guilt feeling I'm feeling is legit. Now, this isn't you beating yourself up. Some, people, some of you are really good at guilting yourself, okay? You've got to learn to separate that from when God's guilting you. Because when God guilts you, it's great. It's, a, it's an act of mercy because you'll never ask for forgiveness. You'll never repent of your sins if you don't know you've sinned. Now, it's not pleasant, but it's life-changing to repent of your sins. And it starts with confession. I agree with you, Lord, that that attitude I had on Friday was wrong, wicked, foolish, and caused your son Jesus to die on the cross. So, you know, before you try to give me, cut me some slack and say, oh, Darren, that wasn't really that bad. It was bad enough to put Jesus on the cross. Does it need to be any worse? Sin is sin. All sins, all big and small in our eyes, put Jesus on the cross, okay? Some have bigger consequences. Some have smaller consequences. But there's still sin against the holy God. It's important that we recognize that. And Jesus died for all of them. I don't know what you're dragging around in your suitcase of guilt. I don't know what sin has got you, but you might think, I have a sin that God can't forgive. Well, that means you just don't believe he can or will forgive you. But God demonstrates his love in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, Romans 5, 8. And there's no sin too big for Jesus, okay? Because he didn't sin. He lived the life we lived, was tempted as we are, went to the cross, died for the sins of the world without ever having committed a sin which is makes him the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, which John the Baptist will say about him later. And therefore, we have hope. It starts with confession. It's not just being sorry. It's not just feeling bad, because sometimes we feel bad because we got caught, right? Let's just be honest. We, oh, man, this, I feel bad because, and fill in the list. But, but here we are. Confess their sins, they were baptized. So when people would come to John after he would say, repent, they would repent, and he would dunk them, okay? And I'll show you where that 
word comes, dunk comes from in the Greek, okay? This was not just, so this is two levels of repentance. Individuals are being, are repenting of their sins. They're coming and they're personally saying, I repent of this sin. I said this, I thought this, I did this, I didn't do this, I should have done, whatever. And he symbolically says, I'm baptizing you and that cleanses you. Jews didn't get baptized. This was unusual. Jews didn't get baptized. You know who got baptized? Gentiles who wanted to become followers of the God of, Jew, of the Jews. Those, those are proselytes. Those are people who were converted from whatever they believed or didn't believe to the God of, of the Jews. Those people got baptized. So the Jews were like, we don't need to get baptized. We have Abraham. Yeah, we don't need that. That's for those people that, you know, born terrible. But they saw, but he, but when he, that is John the Baptist, I'm in verse 7 now, but when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, they are religious leaders of the Jews, Jewish religious leaders. He said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee the coming wrath? Now, I've never been called a brood of vipers, or part, I've never been called a brood, I've never been called a viper. Um, I'm not sure how to take that, but this is how they would have taken it, I think. Okay, brood means offspring. And if you think of the serpent of serpents, we think of Satan in the Garden of Eden. You offspring of Satan himself, you, all of you. Now, why would he speak so harshly to them like that? Because they were misleading the people of God. They were leading people away from God's grace to God's rules and legalism and all these man-made, constructed rules around God's law so they wouldn't even get near God's law. And they were making a mountain out of a mohill about the rules and we were just missing out on the grace and mercy of God. Okay? So he had nothing kind to say about them or to them. So he's not even concerned about warning them. Who warns you? You're like, get out of here. You know, they're there to check on him, right? We've heard there's this guy... Crowds are coming. He's probably a blasphemy. I mean, he's preaching in the middle of the river. What, can, what good is that? He's, you know, he's wearing what he's wearing. He's eating what he's wearing. He's probably got something in his teeth. And they're like, this guy is not okay. So they come check him out. Then he gives them the answer, though, to what if they do, if they're listening, if their hearts are tender, what would they repent and do? This is what he says, verse 8. And this is the verse you need to latch on to. If you're wondering whether you need to repent or not, check this against your heart. Verse 8. Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Now, this is metaphorical language, okay? But metaphor pointing to a reality. He's saying, I want you to produce spiritual fruit that looks like you've repented, genuinely repented of your sins. So when we, what's spiritual fruit? Well, if you go to Galatians 5, you'll see that Paul gives us a list. It's not an exhaustive list, but it's a pretty good list, pretty comprehensive. And, and it says that the fruit of the Spirit of God is nine things. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Now, if, if you're here not married you want to find a person like that and marry them, right? Someone who just oozes those things, right? You, that's what you're looking for, like somebody who will do that because you're thinking, I got maybe three of those, but, you know, somebody like that, they'll love me. You know, you're looking for that. Those of you that are married, you're like, yes, that would be awesome. <laughs> Wouldn't it? Wouldn't it be cool to be a part of a church where people did that? People actually produced the fruit, right, consistently, humbly and when they didn't they repented that would be beautiful people would take note people would come from everywhere to hear whatever's being said in that place just like they were here and John just says produce fruit in keeping with repentance do that convince me through your actions that you've actually repented of anything before a holy and awesome God verse 9 says and do not think that you can say to yourselves we have Abraham as our father. What are they basically saying? Um, it's kind of like if I went and I said, and I'm not a, let's say I'm not a, a Christian, and I go, well, I'm good because my granddaddy, he was with God. He, was, mm -hmm. he, was, he walked with the Lord, taught Sunday school, was faithful in his giving, and he, he, he walked to church. He, you know, he was there. 
He and his whole family went. And so, you know, I'm good because I'm related to him. And God's going, <laughs> no. He's not. I'm not. I cannot get to God on someone else's faith. God says, this is, this is between you and me. This is the real deal. And he is speaking to me in ways that I can hear if I choose to hear, if I allow him to speak and respond to him. So they're looking to Abraham, and, and, and John here is saying, uh, don't think you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children of Abraham. So God is not limited in who he can raise. <laughs> He's saying these rocks have a better chance of being followers of Jesus than you do, religious leader which should be a warning to all of us religious leaders. It's easy to find yourself there and knowing up here and not getting it here. It's very easy to get there. The axe is already at the root of the trees. Now he's talking judgment. And John the bee, man, he can talk some judgment. Here's another metaphor. The axe is already at the root of the trees. It's, not, it's like it's there and there, the action is happening and the tree's about to go. And every tree that does not, here's the standard, produce good fruit. I was not producing good fruit on Friday afternoon, was I? I wasn't. That my actions, attitudes, and words were inconsistent with repentance. Now, when I repented, that began to change. And I found a peace and a grace and a mercy that I didn't deserve because God is faithful. The axe is already there. Every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Metaphorical, eternal separation from God. You'll live forever somewhere. The question is with or without God. Verse 11. Now we get into some more of the baptism. He was baptizing Jews. Now we're going to get, it's going to start to change. I baptize you, you Jews, you people, water with water for repentance. So this is a little different baptism than what we do now. We baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the triune God, they baptized to symbolize repentance to God. So those folks didn't understand the triune God because they didn't know about them. That they didn't really understand Messiah is going, this king of kings is going to be deity in the flesh. They didn't understand that yet. It was still veiled. Most of them didn't get that, if any. So he says, I baptize you with water for repentance. But after me comes one who is more powerful than I. He's talking about his cousin, Jesus more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. In that time, if you were a Jew and you had servants or slaves, washing someone's feet after they'd walked down the road with all the donkey apples that were all on the road and come into your house and you're like, well, wash their feet, please, you wouldn't even ask your Jewish servant to do that. You would ask the Gentile servant to do that. That's how low it was. And John is putting himself down there and saying, I'm not worthy to carry his sandals anywhere. That's who's coming after me. That's who I'm preparing for you to come to, and you need to repent to prepare. And he says this, I'm not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Ooh, that sounds different than water. And fire, which is another symbol of the Holy Spirit. And then he uses another, and I'll come back to that. And then he uses another analogy or imagery for judgment. John is not a church growth guy. <laughs> He's not trying to grow a church. His winnowing fork, okay, I, I kind of picture a giant spork, but I'm not sure. The, his winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, and gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Okay, so that imagery probably doesn't make sense to a lot of us. So let, let me explain it to you. So when you bring in the wheat, when the wheat matures, okay, you plant wheat, it grows up. It looks like, you know, tall, tall grass with these little seeds on the top. You harvest that, and it looks like hay. You bring that in, and then you take it to the threshing floor. And the threshing floor is where you thresh it. Okay, and don't ask me what threshing is exactly, but this is kind of what I think. You pile it there. You stomp on it. You tromp on it. You beat it. You, you break it up. Okay, because you want the grain heads to fall off the chaff, the, the stalks, the leaves, right? And so you break it, and then when, it, when you think you've done it well enough, you take this giant spork, winnowing fork, whatever it is, and you throw it up in the air when the wind's blowing. And when the wind's blowing, the lighter stuff blows to the side, and the heavier stuff falls right back down onto the threshing floor. Well, guess what's heavier? It's the 
the wheat heads, the good stuff, the stuff you want to keep. So the chaff gets blown away. What's the imagery? Okay, People are part, there's going to be this harvest at the end, day of judgment, right? And people are going to be one of two things. They're either going to be the seed head of the wheat, the fruit of the crop, or they're going to be the rest of it, the the chaff that is only suitable to be used to start fires. And so God's going to separate those with his winnowing fork. He's going to throw it. He's not going to throw us in the air, but you get the idea. It's imagery to say God is going to separate those who have repented and believed from those who have not. It's very straightforward. John is not trying to get cute here. He's just saying it. And this is, this is why it's so important, because if you don't hear this, you don't know to respond to this. But when you hear it, you're responsible to respond to it. You're accountable. Now, we're accountable anyway because the stars declare the heavens of God. The heavens declare the glory of God, and that should be enough, but it, he gives us more. He gives us, he gives us more here. Now, he, this baptism of Jesus is how we end it. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan. So he's moving back south from the region of Galilee back to the region of Judah. He's, and and if, if, I'm, if, if you're looking at the map, you have uh, the region of Galilee, the region of Jordan, and you have the, sorry, the Jordan River, which comes to the Sea of Galilee. Then it comes out of the Sea of Galilee into the Dead Sea, and, of course, there's no outlet there. And this region is Judah, Galilee, and Samaria is in there. But Jesus is going back and forth between Galilee and Judea, Galilee and Judea, okay? And Judea was considered the more holier people because they're closer to the temple, and those in Galilee are considered, eh, they're kind of Jew wannabes. They're Jewish, but they're just different tribes, and that's just where their land was. Jesus is coming from Galilee back down towards Judah, but he heads to the Jordan River, sorry, to the Jordan River to see John the Baptist, who's preaching, his cousin, because he knows and God is sending him, okay? And what we're seeing here is a transition for Jesus, Okay? We know very little about Jesus up to the age of around 30. We get the scene when he's 12, we get the birth narratives, but we really don't get anything else. Not in Scripture. Um, he is about to get baptized, and then the Holy Spirit will drive him into the wilderness where he will fast for 40 days and nights, and he will then begin his public ministry. So that's when things will really start to happen. Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. Remember, the baptism is a baptism of repentance. Does Jesus need to repent? No. He hasn't sinned. So God hasn't convicted him of sin. So he doesn't need to be repent. He doesn't need to repent, and therefore he doesn't need to be baptized for that reason. But he does need to be baptized. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Jesus replied, Let it be so now. It's proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. So all righteousness, that can include, and this is my take on this, I'm not positive that this is right, so just kind of hold this with a loose hands. I think what he's doing is he's obeying the law of the, of the word of God to the best of his ability. And he's trying to do that in a way that he cannot, he's blameless. He wants to be blameless as far as the law is concerned. Okay? Now, it could be there's some other theories out there, and I'm not sure. The point is, he's like, John, I need to be baptized. I need you to do this. And John graciously cons it says John consented. So the important thing is that Jesus knew what he was doing. He didn't do it for repentance. That's what's important. He did it for righteousness. And I think there's some imagery, and some people would say that he is basically doing this on behalf of us. Okay. I'm not, I'm not sure I follow and understand all that. That's why I didn't spend any much more time on it than that. Verse 16. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. Now, this is a side note, and I'm not going to die on this hill, but if you, have, if you come up out of the water, that means you had to go down into the water. Okay? You see what I'm saying? He wasn't sprinkled. There wasn't water poured over his head. He was put down into the water, and he was raised up out of the water. That's all I'm going to say on that except for this. The word baptize means to immerse. When they were doing the King James Bible in 16-whatever, the, uh, the Anglican priests and, and, and men that were translating the scriptures from Greek and Hebrew into English, 
If they had translated the word baptizo like they did the rest of the Bible, they would have translated it and they would have just said immersion. Okay? Not only because that's what the word means, but because the context in every case it's used means that. Okay? But because the Church of England baptized infants, that's not going to go over real big with mama. You're not dunking my infant on day eight. Okay? So we're going to sprinkle the infants. Why are we baptizing children? That's another whole conversation we can have, and I'm not prepared to go there time-wise mainly. Okay? But because I'm, like I said, I'm, but here's the thing I want you to take, because this is going to answer the question that we we're going to go back to in uh, verse 11. So let me finish this, and then I'll go back to verse 11 and wrap up. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, something major happens. We see the triune God in, in one of the few places we see this. At that moment, heaven was opened, which I'm like, what does that mean? Sky open, what does that look like? Is this metaphorical? Is this literal? It's real, whether it was metaphorical or not, I don't know. But at that moment, heaven was open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove. Is that a simile? Like or as? Metaphor, like or as? Simile? Okay? So does that mean he saw a dove? Does he see something descending like? We don't know. It's con this is controversial. But this, again, the point is the Spirit of God is coming down and lighting on him, and a voice from he lighting on him, verse 17, and a voice from heaven said, this is my son, God doesn't speak in scripture out loud very often, this is my son, whom I love, with him I am well pleased. This is my son whom I love. God the Father is affirming God the Son as his son. He did it out loud. Now, I don't know if everybody understood him or not. I don't know. The implication here is that if you were around and you would have heard it too, but I don't know that. Matthew knows, apparently, because he writes it down. I don't know where Matthew got it. I don't know if Jesus told him or if he heard it. Because um, Matthew probably wasn't there. Well, he could have been, but I don't think he was. We don't know. Um, and then, so here's the thing. He could say the same thing to you and me. God could say to you, you are the son or daughter whom I love. You are my beloved. Okay? Forget the second part for a second. Just because. He created you. So when you look in the mirror and you're tempted to go, God doesn't love me, I'm a mess, I hate what I see, God doesn't agree. He loves you. Period. And it's not based on your performance. It's not based on how much or how little you've sinned. It's not based on who your mom or daddy is. It's not based on what ethnicity you are. It's not based on how good you are at reading the Bible. It's simply because you were created in his image and he loves you. Okay? Amen. Just like he loves his son. It's not just like he loves his son, but as much as he loves his son. It's different. Their relationship is unique. Okay? Then he adds... With him I am well pleased. Well, if your son had never done anything wrong, you'd be pretty pleased with him too, wouldn't you? I'd be good with just most of the time. Okay? Now, with you and I, we don't meet that standard. <laughs> okay? But when we do that which he's called us to do, he is pleased. But his love for us is not geared on whether we do a good job or not. That's what I want you to see. His love for you is separate from your performance. He notices your performance. He notices your behavior. And if it's not glorifying to him, you're going to be convicted of that. And you're going to feel the conviction and the guilt, and you're going to be moved to repent. Now, you may or may not, but you see where I'm going now. Back to 11. Let me finish with this. And I realize this will be controversial, and I'm okay with that. I baptize you with water for repentance. But after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So here's the way I understand it. And there's lots of good people that disagree with me on this, okay? So you just need to dig in and research and figure this out for yourself. What is baptism of the Holy Spirit? This is what I think it is. I think, just like when I am baptized, I am symbolizing my salvation. I believe that when I uh, am born again and become a follower of Jesus Christ, that I am at that moment spiritually baptized and immersed into the living water of the Holy Spirit. And therefore, he indwells and lives in me. And that's why Paul can say in Ephesians and 1 Corinthians that we have a seal in us. The Holy Spirit seals us until the day of redemption. Well, when does that start? I believe it starts when, by grace through faith, I trusted Jesus. Okay? Any additional filling or whatever you want to call it 
is legit if it's good with Ephesians 5, where, where Paul says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's a command. We're commanded to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I thought you said when I trusted Jesus that it was done. I was automatically filled. Yes. So they must be different because one depends on God and one depends on us. Some Christians, well, all Christians are baptized, I believe, immersed into the Holy Spirit and they are, he indwells them. And they never are filled with the Holy Spirit because they never obey the command for whatever reason. Maybe they don't understand. Maybe they don't know what that means. And our terminology may be different because lots of traditions use different words here. And so when it, don't get all, all upset with, with somebody if they disagree with you on this because sometimes it's just the words we're using. And sometimes it's because we're meaning different things and we just disagree. It's okay. At the end of the day, because people have prayed for me to be baptized in the Holy Spirit multiple times and I never do whatever it is they want me to do when they're done. So apparently... Um, I'm, I need to repent, but the point is that I want more of God, okay? I don't care what you call it. I want more of God, and I want, but I, I'm coming to him on his terms. I don't deserve any of God, so I'll take whatever I can get, and if I just get the crumbs, amen. I don't even deserve the crumbs, okay? So we get him. That's why we get the gifts of the Spirit. That's why we get the fruit of the Spirit. That's birthday gifts that come along with our born-again experience, but there is subsequent Somehow there's subsequent fillings of the Holy Spirit that are available to us that we're called to, commanded to obey, that I don't have time to explain and probably wouldn't do a good job of it anyway, to say, okay, let's give people room to say, my experience is a little different than yours. Okay, that's okay. Amen. God is a diverse God. He can do things in a lot of amazing ways. Let's just be glad that he did, and let's praise him for it. So what is repentance? It's a changing in the way that we think that leads into the way that we live which implies the way that I think is not good at times. When God convicts me of that, I need to change. I need to do a spiritual about face and march towards God in such a way that my beliefs and my behaviors reflect the glory of God. Okay? I know that was a lot. I appreciate your patience. Let me pray. Lord God, I thank you. Thank you, thank you that you hear my prayers when I ask, when I repent and turn to you by grace through faith. Lord, I thank you that Jesus died on the cross for my sins, making forgiveness possible. I, I repent of taking that for granted. I repent of rushing through the process of repentance. I repent of not dwelling on that reality in my heart and mind near enough. Help us repent of whatever it is you're putting on our hearts right now right now so that when we come and take the bread that represents the body of Jesus abused and crucified the blood of Christ that represents his truly dying so that we might live as we come and celebrate that that we might come as people who believe that Jesus made a way for us to be reconciled to our creator by grace through faith starting with repentance of faith the faith to believe that if we repent he will forgive we come to you, Lord, as individuals that want that. We come to you, Lord, as a church family that needs that sanctification, that part of the salvation that we're in the middle of, so that at the end of our salvation experience, the glorification where we go home, Lord, that we will be completely saved. That's why we can say, I look forward to the day of salvation, even as we look back and say, thank you for saving me. May we recognize that repentance is an essential part of sanctification, of becoming more like Jesus. Help us do the things we need to do now that might change us to be more like Jesus today. In Christ's name we pray.